And it's followed by a skin rash of vesicular or pustular skin lesions that progressed over time and scab and then re-epithelialized. So, and there could be serious complications that include uh, pneumonia, encephalitis, sepsis, and ocular infections. Often some of these are, are uh, bacterial super infections. Um, and over uh, the past year from uh, January 1st, 2022 to January 5th, 2023, there've been over 84,000 cases reported uh, globally, as most people are, are aware, uh, the vast majority are due to a new lineal lineage claim to be that's been reported from uh, locations that have not historically reported MPOX. Now, in Nigeria, which is the site of the proposed trial, there have been 750 cases uh, from January 1st of uh, last year to January 5th from this year. So in terms of the need for an RCT in Africa, um, pre-exposure uh, vaccination is probably the, the most, is the most comprehensive vaccination strategy, uh, but it certainly takes time, uh, takes a lot of resources, and it takes a lot of doses of vaccine that are, you know, at a premium. So uh, the idea for this trial is a post-exposure prophylaxis uh, trial with smallpox vaccine. And it allows for targeting of high-risk groups. In this case, it's going to be household contacts of an index case. It minimizes the vaccine supply and potentially can provide uh, long-term protection, if not one, with one dose, with two doses. So uh, an important unanswered question is the efficacy of post-exposure prophylaxis with smallpox vaccine to reduce the risk of MPOX for household contacts. So there have been a number of case series. There have been no uh, randomized controlled trials of post-exposure prophylaxis. And as far as I'm aware, there's, uh, you know, there, there's nothing uh, being planned apart from this, uh, from this uh, study. Um, so the vaccine that we're uh, proposing to use is the uh, modified vaccine of Bavarian Nordic vaccine. Uh, and we've been in contact with the company for months right now. So the acronym is the MBABN vaccine. So it's a non-replicating smallpox vaccine. Um, it's, it's, it's really the only one currently available to do an MPOX post-exposure trial. There are a few other vaccines uh, there's uh, there's one that's been used uh, in Japan, the LC6 uh, M18, um, and there's one the um, there, there's one that's stockpiled in uh, at CDC uh, in the US, but it's not uh, currently available. I think Sanofi has one, but again, they're not available. So this is a a safe vaccine that's rather readily available uh, to do uh, an RCT. Now, it was licensed based on cha challenge studies in a primate model and on immunogenicity, so there are no randomized trial data uh, of its effectiveness. So the CDC has published some, uh, there's been one observational uh, study that, that uh, was recently published that actually looked at, uh, essentially they just made use of, uh, of your experience of individuals being exposed to, to the, the vaccine and compared uh, MPOX rates in those individuals to those who were not vaccinated. And the, the attack rate was about 15 times higher in those that had not been vaccinated. Um, and that was in what they said was uh, the, uh, you know, the lower rate was in individuals who had received a vaccine and in the past 14 days or over 14 days, but they, they don't give much information on exposure, unfortunately. So the, the primary aim of this trial then is to determine if the MVABN vaccine can reduce RT-PCR confirmed MPOX in, in exposed household contacts uh, of confirmed uh, MPOX cases. So the design is a pragmatic, uh, adaptive, and by adaptive, uh, we mean that uh, depending on how the event rate goes, uh, we might need to readjust the sample size. Uh, it's a multi-center, blinded, uh, cluster randomized controlled trial in household members of index cases of MBOX. So the idea basically is uh, we enroll households where uh, more, there's at least one person um, uh, who's been a contact of a uh, lab confirmed case of MPOX. So the household is the, the unit of uh, randomization. 
So the interventions, again, uh, the experimental group is the MVABN, uh, Invimmune uh, vaccine. And so this is a vaccine that's uh, available in Canada and the United States. It goes by different names, but it's always, the, it's the same product, uh, the Bavaria Nordic uh, product. And the idea is to give 0.5 mils uh, subcutaneously of the vaccine uh, once. We're going with one dose within, within 14 days of the onset of illness. Uh, in the index uh, MPOX case. Um, and the control vaccine, and the, we selected the control based on um, investigators in Nigeria about the typhoid vaccine, uh, the intramuscular vaccine, same, so same volume, 0.5 mils would be the best choice. So that's given uh, similarly within 14 days of onset of illness uh, in the uh, index uh, uh, MPOX case. So again, we're we're doing it with respect to the onset of illness in the index case, giving the vaccine uh, to the household contacts. So uh, the inclusion criteria include uh, obviously being a household member of a person with lab confirmed uh, MPOX, uh, age over 10 years. We sort of debated that the, the age cut off, we had it lowered. Some, some people were reluctant. There's a little bit less information on uh, the experience with age, but people were, uh, we're comfortable with the age over 10 years. Uh, and again, exposure within 14 days of onset of illness in the MPOX index case. We'd exclude individuals who are pregnant uh, or breastfeeding, uh, past serious allergic reaction to any of these study vaccine components. Uh, we'd also uh, exclude probably the, the older people who'd had a previous smallpox vaccination because uh, their risk would be uh, very, very different, uh, low, much lower. And we'd exclude those who received or are receiving an invest investigational drug or a vaccine over the course uh, of the uh, of the trial. So randomization would be computer generated centrally. We'd stratify by the centers. So there's eight centers in uh, Nigeria, all over uh, Nigeria. The participants, the investigators, the outcome assessors, and the lab technologists would be blinded. Uh, however, the nurses who administer vaccines would be unblinded. And that's really how most vaccine trials are, are, are done. People don't tamper with the vaccines, you know, to make them look similar. Um, you have uh, a set of administrators who that's all they do. They just administer the vaccine. Typically, it's done in uh, if it's in a home, it's in a different room or it's in a, if it's a clinic and it's a different clinics. So they just draw it up in one room and then administer it uh, in another. So the follow-up be, would be over uh, 28 days. Um, there'd be telephone contact uh, weekly. We originally had thought that we uh, you know, would like to have done texting. So a lot of people in Nigeria, they, they'll have uh, cell phones, but it's mainly telephone use. They don't have data, so we can't have sort of text follow-up. So it'd be telephone contact. And we collect samples. Um, at any time upon symptom onset. So basically by samples, I mean to try to, to confirm the primary outcome, which is MPOX confirmed uh, RT-PCR. Um, and the, we would do systematic routine sample collection. This would pick up asymptomatic MPOX uh, using looking at blood collection, saliva, uh, nasopharyngeal, any lesion swabs uh, on day seven and day 28. Uh, any participant who decides to wear red, who's randomized and decides they don't want to get the vaccine, we'd follow them up anyway uh, to the designated uh, final visit. So this is the, you know, the sort of difficulty, you know, we were sort of having, uh, which is with the, the primary outcome. So originally we had designated, you know, for sure, the best outcome is RTP, RTPCR confirmed MPOX. Uh, but the problem is this 14-day delay. You know, it, ideally, what we'd want to do is um, identify an index case, and within three days, you know, randomize the uh, the household contacts to uh, to MPOX, you know, vaccine or the 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 uh, Bavaria Nordic product or typhoid vaccine. But it, that's just impossible to do, right? We can't. The, these are household contacts. So if there's been this continuous exposure. So 14 days might even be optimistic, but that's that's the way we we'll, would we'll run it. And the problem with that is that the MPOX vaccine um, might not prevent 
uh, mpox or the smallpox vaccine might not prevent mpox, but it could reduce severity in breakthrough cases. So the primary outcome wasn't capturing that. The secondary outcomes were, but not the primary. Uh, so we thought, well, you know, what would be ideal perhaps would be if there was an RT-PCR confirmed some sort of, we called it a, originally a burden of illness scale or severity of illness scale that would be ideal because it would capture the incidence uh, as well as the, the severity of symptoms or the number of symptoms, uh, but there was none that was validated. Um, so we looked at a scale that was based on a, a DRC that, uh, that's uh, data from the Congo. Uh, they have a, a point system, um, but, but it was sort of problematic to at least to, to, to many of the uh, Nigerian investigators because it wasn't derived from cases in Nigeria. They thought that the severity uh, might be different again in uh, because of the clay difference, the, uh, the symptoms might be uh, might be milder. Um, it's it, it's ordinal data, so we thought of comparing the means, but we thought it could get into some problems, particularly if there's a panel of statisticians uh, ultimately re reviewing the paper, one might have a problem with this. Um, and we, we thought about then a binary outcome. So if we look at a some sort of severity score and we say, okay, we'll use a severity score of let's say over two, uh, you know, could that solve the problem? But the problem then is that if there if there was less severity in the in the uh, control group, if they weren't meeting that severity score, um, their events you know wouldn't be counted. So so we it would lower events in the control group. So it wouldn't do us a favor um, with with respect to the trial. So going through all this, we finally concluded, oh, you know, let's go back to uh, RT PCR as the as the primary. So this is a uh, a just a uh, synopsis of the the severity scale. It's really accounting the numbers of symptoms and signs, and then uh, assigning various points to the uh, to the categories. So the secondary outcomes are really based on some of the earlier uh, WHO recommendations, both for vaccine trials and and also for antiviral trials. So time to resolution of skin lesions time to resolution of symptoms, the number of patients, the number of symptoms, number of signs, and monkeypox complications, uh, pneumonia, encephalitis, sepsis, ocular lesions, proctitis, urethritis. Um, we also, pain has been reported to be, you know, uh, an important outcome of uh, mpox infection. So we uh, looked at a zoster brief pain inventory, uh, which is adopted for the, the monkeypox for for mpox. It's it's very you know a very simple inventory. I think it's like ten kind of, ten questions or perhaps even less. Uh, and also looked at the World Health Organization quality of life scale. The rationale for that was was we wanted something that had been used and validated in in uh, countries in Africa. Um, and we wanted to include all-cause hospitalization and all-cause mortality as well. So the sample size is based on a secondary attack rate of 6% in the control group. So that attack rate is based on data from Nigeria from, I think it was from 2017 to 2019. Uh, and uh, we estimated four unvaccinated members per household. So the average household size, of course, it's going to be variable, but is, is five. So if you discount the index case, we thought four, uh, and we uh, calculated the sample size with an ICC of 0 .0, uh, 0.01, and finally estimated a sample size of 195 households in each group, 780, so 1560 uh, in all. This would allow 80% power to detect a 50% relative risk reduction. Uh, in our TPCR confirmed mpox with the uh, with the MVABN vaccine, the analysis would be a generalized linear mix model of the logistic link and the random intercept per household to account for clustering. And as a secondary analysis, um, we propose doing multivariable analysis where various co covariates could be considered when modeling the effect of the vaccine on our TPCR confirmed mpox. And we plan some subgroup uh, analysis looking at uh, whether 
quality variables with modified treatment effect, age, sex, time to vaccination, uh, the presence or absence of comorbidities at baseline or the extent of household exposure. Of all of those, I think the time to vaccination is the most important, uh, followed by the, the extent of household exposure. So this is a, a flow diagram of what I was just uh, describing uh, with the, uh, you know, our iterative process of defining the, uh, the primary outcome, which we settled on uh, RT-PCR confirmed uh, MPOX. Uh, and we also planned a, uh, a uh, cohort sub-study. So the index case could be enrolled or at least uh, a uh, a subgroup of them, um, collect baseline data, and then collect really serum, saliva, nasopharyngeal specimens, a swab of skin lesions, test these for PCR, do follow-up at day seven and at 28, since we're doing that in with the other household members anyway, sequence, um, you know, the, the PCR product, look at serum, saliva, antibodies, uh, cytokine, chemokines, and, and ambitious, but perhaps PBMCs, to look at uh, T cells. Uh, data management would be collected on electronic case record forms. Uh, obviously all data would be kept secure, confidentiality protected and uh, be managed and stored in a, in a database uh, at, uh, at McMaster. And I'll stop sharing because that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, handing over to Alfonso. I'm not sure whether we lost him. No, he's coming. Okay, here he is. Alfonso? Yeah, uh, I was checking if Gordon is uh, on, but I'm pretty sure he is. Gordon, you have a slide to share, I guess? Yeah, I'm ready to go right in if that's what you want. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, I, I, I will uh, leave any comments for the end. And uh, I, again, uh, we are so lucky this morning that we can cut short on introduction. And uh, um, we'll now get uh, some more into the um, um, technical, uh, well, not technical detail of the trial, really methodological consideration uh, on uh, the specific points that Mark very clearly uh, described as critical for this trial, and then we'll um, move all together into a discussion. Please, Gordon. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so there would be many interesting things that one could discuss in methodologic issues, uh, but Mark highlighted the outcome issues, and those are the ones on which I'm going to focus. So I'm going to talk about what one might call the tyranny of the primary outcome, briefly about biology versus importance, and then how one might maximize information from Mark's trial, taking a health status measurement perspective. So here is a study that PJ Devereux uh, led and finished recently, comparing accelerated versus standard care in hip fracture patients. He called it hip attack, a randomized trial in which patients were randomized to go to surgery as quickly as possible, um, uh, versus delayed conventional. And in fact, they got a gradient in time of surgery. The intervention group got surgery within six hours on average, and it was 24 hours in the control. So appreciable gradient in timing of surgery. Um, the hazard ratio for mortality was a 9% hazard reduction, but a confidence interval that included a 14% hazard increase. The major complications was a 3% hazard reduction with a confidence interval that included a 13% hazard increase. And the interpretation in the abstract in the Lancet was among patients with a hip fracture, accelerated surgery did not significantly lower the risk of mortality or a composite of major complications compared with standard care. Uh, a focus on the uh, two uh, primary outcomes. Um, the notice also is a focus on the outcomes and it's also a focus on conventional levels of statistical significance. Well, there were other outcomes that were measured. There was a significant reduction in stroke in the intervention group, although a very small number of events. There was a significant reduction in delirium 
with a quite substantial number of events, a 28% uh, reduction in the odds of developing delirium, a 3% absolute risk reduction. There was a uh, potentially compelling reduction in infection without sepsis. So that's not a major complication, but a complication that still may be important to people. Again, a 28% odds reduction with the upper boundary, a 8% reduction. And urinary tract infections were also lower. Now, one might say, well, who cares about delirium? Who cares about infection with sepsis? Not important. Maybe the absolute effects are small. But maybe we should care about that. Maybe it's at least relevant to consider um, when, um, uh, when looking at these results. And should it be something that's important enough to put in the abstract, perhaps? Um, perhaps even a more compelling example from a study that looked at five-year outcomes after percutaneous interventions or coronary bypass grafting in patients with left main coronary disease. In the New England Journal in 2019, the conclusion was as follows. In patients with left main coronary disease of lower intermediate anatomical complexity, there was no significant difference between PCI and cabbage with respect to the rate of the composite outcome of death stroke or MI. This composite was the primary endpoint as specified by the authors. Once again, um, a focus exclusively on the primary outcome and a focus on statistical significance. Well, as it turned out, if you look at the primary outcome, it occurred in 22% of patients in PCI and 19% of patients in cabbage. Um, a point estimate of a 20% increase in odds, but the confidence interval overlaps no effect consistent with a 10% reduction. However, if you take what were described by the authors as secondary outcomes, um, it turns out there was a uh, borderline bordering on no effect, but a 40% increase in the odds of dying uh, with PCI versus cabbage. Stroke, very little difference. MI periprocedural, more in the cabbage group. MI later, more in the uh, PCI group. Um, and the latter, uh, both of those being significant, but you know, opposite effects. Well, should we just, is the conclusion no difference between the two groups appropriate or in deciding, if you were a patient deciding uh, between these two procedures, would you want to know about particularly the suggestion that you're going to die more frequently if you have PCI? We would think perhaps most patients would want to know that. Uh, the, bo the bottom line of this is that um, uh, there to focus exclusively on the primary outcome and exclusively on the issue of statistical significance may not be such a good idea. So let's apply this to Mark's study. Uh, in an email that Mark wrote me, uh, he said uh, he had a PS to all the information. I, I bugged Mark incessantly about uh, in a whole series of emails. Tell me about this, Mark. Tell me about the other thing. And in one of these emails, he had a PS, which was taken together, the secondary outcomes would capture severity, even if the primary outcome of PCR confirmed MPOX is not significant. Unfortunately, it would still be considered a negative trial by the journals. Well, let's look, say the results look like this. Um, the a suggestion of a reduction in infection uh, with the intervention as the primary outcome, but a confidence interval that overlap, no effect. Uh, symptom threshold outcome is specified as a secondary outcome would have an effect. And let's say those confidence intervals, the lower one, eh, maybe a borderline of importance, the upper one, the point estimates in the upper one, clearly important. Um, so I would ask you, if somebody wants to speak up, that is great. Uh, if not, that's okay too. But What's your interpretation? What's your, what would you conclude from this uh, uh, result? And what do you think the journals would do? Anybody wanna, anybody wanna make a suggestion? Okay, if not, that's okay. I will offer mine. My uh, interpretation of this is that it is likely 
that the intervention both reduces the infection rate and uh, uh, reduces symptoms, not definitive. You wouldn't end up as high certainty evidence out of this, but uh, that is certainly the suggestion. The journal is liable to say, as Mark suggested, this is a negative trial and does not support use of the intervention, which the interpretation I offered would probably not be the uh, interpretation that would be correct from the point of view of both patients and clinicians. Now, what happens if you get exactly the same result, but Mark had decided to make the symptom threshold the primary? Should the interpretation differ because of the uh, Mark was debating, should I do this, should I do that? If he comes down on one side or the other with exactly the same results, should the interpretation differ? I would suggest, no, it should not differ. And thus the designation of a primary outcome and, and the exclusive focus on primary outcome is uh, misleading. Um, so the alternative perspective is the ones that the big journals tend to be taking, all strong conclusions from the primary outcome, and everything hinges on the p-value of the threshold. Secondary outcomes played down, only hypothesis generating, often don't include in the abstract, uh, never included in the conclusion. On the other hand, what, how might, how, what is the alternative that we might address, which is a thoughtful consideration of all outcomes important to patients? And the way we, one might look at this is congruence across the outcomes. And in what I just showed you, it was using that congruence threshold to come to conclusions of the two outcomes of preventing the infection and reducing its severity. And a, um, uh, also not a... Uh, focus on the p-value threshold, but a consideration both of point estimates and confidence intervals. P.J. Devereux is very miffed at the, uh, uh, he's had a couple of bad experiences with his uh, top papers and she gets published in Lancet and NEJM regularly. And this tyranny of the primary outcome has really irritated him. So he formed a group that's led by uh, Rachel Eichelboom, who's doing her PhD here, um, and uh, uh, to address this issue. And we decided as a strategy to try and nudge the journals to moving, we would do a user's guide on how clinicians should look at secondary outcomes in trials. JAMA is in fact interested, and we, uh, Rachel is leading us in preparing this user's guide. Um, the key issues are look at confidence intervals and not p-values and look at the congruence across all outcomes in making your inferences. So um, the uh, so uh, what might uh, Mark is expecting to be a victim of this tyranny of the primary outcome and one simple solution is to designate two co-primary outcomes. Um, both one that focuses on symptom severity and one that focuses on transmission. And once you do that, what is the poor journal going to do as they try to impose on you? Well, if you designate co-primary outcomes, uh, that perhaps might be the solution. So um, the issue of biology versus importance. Well, it may, as Mark has pointed out, uh, the intervention might work to either decrease transmission or symptoms. What happens if it decreases transmission, but no difference in symptoms? Taking a biologic perspective, what is one's conclusion? Taking an importance perspective, what is the conclusion? Biologic conclusion, well, the intervention has an effect, it prevents transmission. Is that important to patients? No, not sure. If it, asymptomatic may be important, if asymptomatic people can transmit, and for COVID, for instance, that's clear the answer is yes. My very limited understanding suggests that monkeypox, the answer may well be no. But the importance issue may depend on that. Um, no difference in transmission, but decreased symptoms. Let's say that's the finding. What's the biology conclusion? Well, there is a biologic effect. What's the importance conclusion? Patients consider symptoms importance unequivocally important. Um, bottom line may be, uh, it may be bearing in mind 
explicitly the biology and important issues when uh, thinking about how the results will be interpreted. Um, so, and that would uh, enhance conceptual clarity, uh, preventing transmission, decreasing severity may both be important or may not. Maybe asymptomatic infection is unimportant. Um, the uh, Going back to the issue of the primary outcome, inferences should not differ depending on the choice of the primary. And I suggested a possible consider a possible way to deal with that type uh, tyranny, which is to choose two as co-primary outcomes. I'm going to switch now to the uh, issue of um, the measurement um, of severity. And uh, Mark alluded to this measure that had been developed, which is simply a checklist of symptoms. And you see a whole bunch of them there. The original, as I understand what Mark told me, the original um, uh, checklist that was developed did not say anything about severity. You either have chills or you have fever or you have sweats or you don't. Marcus said, oh, well, we're also going to measure severity on a one to five scale. Uh, either you don't have the symptom at all, minimal severity to a lot more severity. Um, the, but th there are a whole raft of these symptoms. In fact, there are 26 of them. Um, so what is the problems with this measure? 26 items is probably too many when we make up, uh, 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 I've done a lot of work in health status measurement and we make up questionnaires measuring people's experience. We do not use more than typically a dozen items. Try to do a little less. A um, lot of variability and importance, whether you have some fatigue eye or whether you're vomiting may make a, uh, the first may be pretty trivial. The second may be particularly if it's severe, a big deal. And to just have a checklist where they both count the same is problematic. How these questions are asked to the patients is also um, uh, obscure, at least to me. Do you really say, do you have a cervical deformation? Um, uh, I would think most Nigerian patients might have trouble with that to say nothing of our patients. No pre-testing at all of this. We don't know how patients are going to react to it and no val validation. And severity is not considered in the original, although Marx has a modification. This is a very flawed questionnaire, but it might still be useful, particularly with modifications, particularly with the measurement of severity, uh, particularly perhaps focusing on what is most important. Well, now here's the clinical signs, a whole bunch of those as well, that starts with bed bound and diminished activity. Well, what are the issues here? Three of these items sure seem like symptoms to me. Bed bound, how does the, how does the, um, how does the observer do this? He, uh, the observer, she walks into the, or questions the, 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 the patient, um, presumably the patient says they're bed bound. That sounds like a uh, put in the symptoms category to me, as does diminished activity, as does nasal discharge and conge uh, congestion. The other signs are highly unreproducible. Um, how do you go about as a clinician deciding if a patient is dehydrated? Patients don't care about signs. Suggestion, if you're gonna use the symptom questionnaire, Bed bound uh, uh, may, be, may be the most important uh, uh, symptom, and you might want to incorporate the system symptoms in the symptom questionnaire. Otherwise, I would not bother with these signs at all. So Mark mentioned concern uh, if you do use a continuous variable, which would be hugely, in terms of power, would be hugely beneficial. Turning these continuous into binary, you, 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 uh, you lose huge amounts of power. You're much more likely to have show the difference if you do, if you treat it as continuous. Um, the, and then Mark alluded to the fact that there may be statisticians who suffer from severe obsessive compulsive disorder and as a result do not recognize 
that all these problems are typically uh, um, analyzed with parametric measures. And the reason is with large numbers of categories, it's robust not only to more normality, but equal interval assumptions. And we do it all the time. And statisticians who know up from down recognize that it is robust and, and that's not gonna create problems. So um, I mentioned there's lots of problems with these symptom measures. It is, um, uh, uh, poorly developed and not pre-tested to say nothing of validation. However, this is liable to create random error and not bias. Um, its biggest problem is it, it didn't address severity, but Mark is going to measure severity. With severity 26, I've added, you might add the three, uh, um, um, three items uh, from what are now signs, but are actually symptoms. So from a zero to five, your total measure is gonna be from zero to 130 or 145, and I would argue you could analyze parametrically for those with symptoms. Um, if it was included in any of the severity measures, I didn't see it. And it is certainly likely to be the, uh, even with all the limitations, it's likely to be as a continuous variable, most likely to detect effect. Alternative, you could do it if you still, you could, turn, you could turn this still into a categorical. And Mark told you how he, he is going to do it with the, uh, uh, with the turning it into category, which basically ignores, okay, so you could, there's a, uh, a, a number of categories here, but he's gonna turn it into a binary, um, throwing, tossing possible statistical power right out the window. Um, so, well, if you were going to use a categorical or ordinal, what might you do that would be a gain on just setting a single threshold and saying it's binary? Well, your categories might be as follows. Uninfected, infected, asymptomatic, mild, moderate, and severe symptoms. And then the issue would be if you were going to do that, which should gain power for sure, um, the uh, relative to, to any of the binary measures, um, uh, how, where would you set your threshold? Um, so I would use a severity score rather than the number of symptoms, because if all your symptoms, it's a completely different issue. If all your symptoms are very, you have a bunch of symptoms, but they're all very mild versus you have even a few symptoms and they're very severe. The latter is liable to be more important to people. Um, now, Normally, in other situations, you could set your thresholds after looking at the data um, uh, because the uh, distribution of the data will, uh, will determine where the optimal thresholds are. However, uh, um, you're going to elicit outrage. You looked at the data to set your thresholds and uh, people aren't going to like that in the context of randomized trials. So you could say in advance, and we're doing we're doing this more and more, putting in our uh, our protocols to say um, we're going to look at the results and how we how we analyze is going to depend on the results, but laying out in advance how we might do it. Let's say ten percent or less of the controls are symptomatic, then you might do it binary. Then you might not gain much by other categories and uninfected and infected. Fifteen percent of the controls infected. Uninfected, infected with the lowest 10% of scores, which is mild, and then the top severe, 25 infected, you may have another category. Secondary outcomes that Mark has suggested, some comments about these. Not too enthusiastic about resolution of skin lesions, very enthusiastic about time to resolution of, uh, of symptoms. Number of skin lesions, I wouldn't bother. Number of symptoms, I would use the severity scale as a continuous variable instead. Number of signs, forget it. Um, uh, the complications, okay, if enough. If not, what PJ would call tertiary outcomes. In other words, we're going to document them because people will want us to document them, but we don't expect any, anything useful in terms of making inferences. Zoster brief pain inventory. Well, what are the measurement properties? Has somebody looked, has, has this been more rigorously developed than the, the checklist? If, yet, if yes, and particularly if it has, somebody's shown it has decent measurement properties, great. If not, well, maybe not. 
World Health Organization quality of life scale. I'm not familiar with it. Again, if it has good measurement properties, wonderful. If not, why not use the SF12, which does have good measurement properties? All cause hospitalization, same issues. People will want to know, but if it occurs very rarely, you might designate it as tertiary. All cause mortality, as I understand it, it's certain not to show anything useful because the events will be too little, but we're going to measure it, but we know that it's not going to be useful. And finally, um, at the end of the study, and you can plan this, you are going to have a number of symptom measures. You can validate the symptom measures by comparing the results to one another. For instance, if the symptom measures all go together and correlate substantially and uh, 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 the, the effects are consistent, again, the coherence criteria that would support uh, the inferences that, for instance, the vaccine does in fact lower symptoms in a way that's important to patients. So those are my comments and uh, happy then to go to the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Gordon and uh, Mark. Um, Dominic, I think it gets to us uh, to moderate discussion. I see already one question in the in the chat. I renewed invite that uh, Dominic put in the uh, in the chat. Uh, you are welcome to unmute yourself, come on video, uh, and ask the question. Or if you prefer, you can write it down in the chat, and we will. Uh, and we will um, uh, read it loud. I would think that um, it's um, it's fair um, 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 housekeeping, or um, I would say uh, um, I'm missing the word, to offer Mark uh, a, a first chance of any comment if he likes. Oh well, you know, thanks, uh, thanks, Gordon. Those are um, you know amazing, amazing comments. I think it's it's very, very helpful. Um, I consider the the co-primary. Uh, then there's the issue of you know splitting the the alpha, right? Um, that that's a potential, you know that that's that's something potentially that that we could do. The you know the event rate, you know your uh, ordinal you know uh, thresholds. Um, the event rate will, for sure is going to be less than ten percent, right? So um, I definitely think that that sort of looking at it means, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great idea just to pare down the uh, focus on the on the symptoms. It's really good. Um, I disagree with one thing though about the skin lesions. Skin lesions are really important though to to, to patients, in, in particularly in Nigeria. Uh, we were talking to the Nigerian CDC, and they're, they're because of the stigma. They're you know they 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 stay inside, which is um, you know which is sort of a bad thing. So I, I wouldn't want to get rid of of the skin lesions, but but uh, I agree with with everything else. Just paring it it down um, substantially. Um, so no, this is uh, it's really really good. Thanks, Mark Imran. Uh, thanks. Um... Um, Alfonso, and thanks, Mark. Mark, I was just wondering, you know, um, the signs and symptoms scores, which is a list of signs and symptoms and, and severity, has there be, actually been any work or data on this in patients with MPOX? And is this measured every day, every week, retrospectively, active, you know, what? how much do we know about these scoring systems? And, and can we look at those scores that have previously been collected and say, you know what, from these from what we can tell, these are the ones that are most important. Is well, there anything? Well, the only uh, the only thing that that I've seen is not from Nigeria, right? It's mm. from from the DRC, so it's a different clade, and it's this you know this one paper where where they clearly you know they haven't really validated. It's not really severity, but it's almost a, a list of of symptoms, and they haven't really validated it against harder outcomes. I think they've They've done, you know, they've associated it with, with confusion, but there's nothing, as you say, you know, uh, that I've seen at least uh, either from Nigeria or the DRC in terms of uh, almost a natural history looking at these on a, on a daily basis. Um, I've asked uh, someone from WHO, the WHO has been 
you know, supportive of this study for, again, for the last six months. And I'd asked someone from WHO who's sort of collecting case uh, information in, in, uh, in all countries in, in Africa for data. And uh, that person hasn't gotten back to me yet, but I doubt part of the, part of the problem is that I doubt there's going to be a lot of information. And, and just to follow up, you know, I, one might expect that if somebody in my household has MPOX, then that might impact the family member's behavior around that person. And I was just wondering how you account for that. And, and is there any evidence of how, you know, do people just carry on as normal or, or are they kind of isolated? They stay in the bed, they stay in their room and, and try to prevent other people getting in. And do we have you know, some information on, on behavioral patterns? Because that might impact your... Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's that's a good point and, and it's a concern. Um, I... I I don't know. I, I there's there's uh, there's no data that that I've seen uh, on sort of behavioral patterns. That's that's sort of one of the things that we'd be looking in, uh, you know, and as an effect uh, modifier. But we know recently again that the the, the, the secondary attack rate in the household is is six percent. So um, again, the, this is the the challenge with the study. Like this is some of these the questions you're asking. It's a bit of a black box, you know. Mm. Good question, so. Um, I've just um, I very, very recently I'm part of supporting the WHO for making recommendations about isolation of uh, home of people in the home with monkeypox. And the uh, uh, the previous recommendations from WHO was isolation. Um, and uh, anecdotally, the people from on the World Health Organization panel who work in the area say patients routinely, or family members routinely ignore the uh, recommendations about isolation. Okay. Well, I guess that's bad for public health, but in a sense, is uh, is something less that we, you know, something we, I guess, don't have to to worry about that much in terms of the. Uh, the household contact. So, um, yeah. Excellent conversation so far. I see Marek as uh, Marek Zmeja as his Andre. Please, Marek. Sure. So thank you uh, both, uh, Gordon and, and Mark. I'm reminded of a wonderful debate between uh, Alvin Feinstein and David Sackett of two giants sort of with, you know, agreeing, but also disagreeing. Although there we had uh, Lee Goldman uh, refereeing and throwing yellow and red uh, cards every time people, uh, you know, sort of made uh, rude comments. Um, question to Mark is... You know, we, we're pretty sure the most important variable will be the time from, um, you know, from, from vaccination to when you've got immunity. And so whether it's a two-day delay or a seven-day delay is almost certainly going to make a huge difference. Is there a thought of stratifying and even separately analyzing? Because there's a danger that if too many people, there's a time delay, you may actually prove the vaccine doesn't work, but it may well work if it's within the, let's say, 48, 72 hours. It may not work if it's less, you know, over five days or something. Thing. And in my own practice, in my SIS clinic, I had patients who did develop monkeypox who were within, you know, a several days of, of receiving their vaccine. Uh, and almost certainly the vaccine simply didn't have a chance, didn't have time to work. No, that's a good point. Uh, we, again, we, we thought about that. Um, and, um, you know, it, they're just, you know, with the investigators, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't there wasn't consensus uh, about that. Um, you know, I, I, I'll probably uh, reach out to some of the, the people who did this, you know, this CDC study that, that showed, again, about a 15-fold increase in MPOX in those individuals who were, uh, who were not vaccinated compared to those that, that were vaccinated. Um, but, the, but they never really described what the, the time period was with, with exposure. But Again, it is, uh, I agree, I mean, it's a concern, yeah. I believe that there was another hand raised at some point. I, I'm quite sure it was Mitch Levin, but then was taken down. And um, I'm not sure if I have a good or bad recollection. Oh, Mitch, you are here. You are muted, yeah. okay. Yeah, no, I, I took it down because I... I, I but uh, the, the comment that I was going to be is, I, I think you're giving too much power to the journals or acknowledging or that, that 
I mean, you just publish the data. You know, if you had one, a primary that's negative, the secondary that's positive, you know what? You, you, you publish the results. You let the readers decide. Who cares what the journal, if the journal says, look, your primary was negative you, you say that the primary is negative but people can read and and if you read the journal and you see that the primary was slightly negative or not 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 positive and the secondary was which is more important to patients was was a was a significant difference i mean the data will speak for itself it's not that for the journal to decide how people interpret what they're reading i, I just uh -oh. felt that you were you were acceding too much power to the journal or or the the, 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 problem, the, shoes. the problem with that, Mitch, is um, I regularly, in front of all sorts of audience, ask how many people have ever just read the abstract? Uh, and of course, everybody puts up their hands. And then I ask how many people have ever just read the conclusions from the abstract? <laughs> and a whole bunch of people put up their hands. And the journal does control the uh, does control that. Not only that, they can the people then. Uh, quite reasonably, um, may or even if they do read more, they may rely on the authors to tell them how to interpret the data. And then the journals tell you how to write your discussion and say, oh, the only inferences you can make are from your primary outcome. So very nice in a maybe uh, you, Mitch, could will read the whole paper and read between the lines and make your own inferences on the basis of the data that you look at carefully, you will be an unusual clinician if you go about doing that. So great if for people who do that, but for the people who just read the conclusions of the abstract, which may be a uh, uh, considerably more, um, you've got a problem. Okay, and so in late, late, in late of your very uh, negative view of the world, which may be a real world, um, maybe you do need two co-primaries then. Yeah, you, 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 you have to, I mean, take, take into account the whole audience, but for sure, um, a careful look at the data um, to make one's own inferences are going to be, I think, unequivocally a small proportion of the people who look at it. And so you got you, 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 you have to take that into consideration. And, and Mark, you said, uh, oh, we have to split our power for our, you know, just our p-value for our two co-primaries. Again, if you look at the current literature, everybody is agreeing that p-values are stupid, um, hypothesis testing is ignorant, um, and uh, you should look at the you should look at the point estimates and the confidence intervals in making your interpretation. So again, there is a tyranny going on, but it's it the, the problems are number one, the excessive focus on the primary outcome and the pathetic uh, ignoring of the whole picture. And number two, this focus on on hypothesis testing and threshold p values, which is equally silly. Yeah, so we recently got, if I could just say, uh, we recently got burnt on this. So like, you know, six or seven year trial, 5,000 individuals uh, randomized to uh, influenza vaccine looking at cardiovascular outcomes. We made the wrong choice. We, we said we're going to look at events for 12 months. Instead, as a secondary, we used over peak influenza season. So if we looked over peak circulation of influenza, cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality reduction, again, all the journals said, no, 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 this is secondary, it's hypothesis generating, you've missed the boat, this is a negative study. So, yeah. so, so, it's, so it's, a, it's another great example. And, and said, have you published that now? Yeah, we, when we went through, so the New England Journal at first was, was interested in it, and then you know they saw the, the results, negative. Went to the Lancet, they saw it, it got published in Lancet Global Health, which is okay, right? But but it would have certainly got into a higher impact journal had we chosen the right quote. Right, okay, which, it's, which, it's, is which, is exact, which is exactly the point and demonstrates again the stupidity. Do me a favor, I told you we're writing up this user's guide, we need examples of uh, the uh, stupidity of the tyranny of the primary outcome. If you don't mind sending that to me, we could use it for, uh, potentially as an example in the user's guide. Now, Gordon, uh, before giving to Imran, 
Uh, I like your user guide, and I know there's much more than knowledge behind this behavior of journals, and maybe editors will never read a user guide, but a user guide for reviewers about how to assess this matter might actually help changing the mindset. Um, because we are all authors, but we are also all reviewers. And, you know, having reviewers on the right side of the conversation may play a little but significant role in how papers are perceived at journals. I No, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great point, um, but I would uh, hope, as a matter of fact, prior user's guide have made a big influence. In fact, the user's guide were the heart of evidence-based medicine when evidence-based medicine got going and the impact was not inconsiderable. So when we write these user's guides, yes, we write them with clinicians, but uh, I would fully anticipate that they also, uh, uh, the audience will include scientists, they will include reviewers, they will include other, they will include other editors. And past experience with user's guide suggests that might be the case. But your point is great. The reviewers, the journals and the reviewers are key audiences, although we structure it for clinicians. Dominic, I don't know if we are allowed to go two minutes over time. Imran and Riza are lined up for questions. Yeah, I, I would say for people who can stay on, please stay on. And we, we give them a chance to probably for Imran, a follow-up question, so over to you. It's a disagreement with Gordon, I have very short, small disagreement. Aside of the semantics of being bed-bound and whether it's a sign or symptom, I think it might be an important symptom because it's a culmination of somebody who's fatigued, myalgia, fevers, you know, not eating well, and sorry. being... Uh, number sorry, of days... I made, Imran, I did not make myself clear. I think it's the most important symptom in the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Sorry. So I thought that's you why I said it. move it, move it over to the symptoms and make it an imp cr crucial symptom. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I think uh, it is an important symptom, and I uh, uh, it's it's maybe the most important. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry. You're absolutely sorry. right. Okay. I, I see some agreement here. R Reza, do you want to come in or did you? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, the reason it's not a science because you don't watch someone long enough, but that's not my point. I was moving on to my question was, I, I definitely take Merrick's point about the time to vaccination. Um, you know, I think there's definitely a threshold. We just don't know where it is um, in terms of, you know, if they've already infected and the infection is in the throes, the vaccination is probably not going to make a difference. Um, uh, so, but I think it would be a really important secondary analysis to say, whether it's 72 hours or four days. Um, but, you know, I think we've already talked enough about how too many endpoints and if you hit the wrong one as your primary, you may not get anywhere. But nonetheless, I think I think everyone expects that there is a threshold and it'd be nice to know if there's a signal where that threshold might be for future studies or just, you know, uh, to give us a sense of where to start. Okay, I, I, I'm afraid we have to cut it here. Now, let me say it will be very difficult to do better in the future. But if you want uh, Dominique and I to um, coordinate having more of these, shout, shut out an email, let us know, and uh, we'll try to come back on this uh, podium. Dominique, any final word? No, just wanted to uh, to mention for the next rounds, um, we will have Despernica presenting a study that's also in, in the early stages, and we will try to find what methodological aspect we want to discuss in more detail. So more to come, but looking forward to the next rounds. And thank you to the two speakers again for excellent, outstanding presentations. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.